Hello everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the first video. Today, we're going to do a poem about a very, very important topic, a very universal topic, a topic that has been written about time and time again in poetry, love. Now, if you will know love poetry, it has really a long history, starting from the Greek poetess Sappho to the famous poet William Shakespeare and his famous 154 sonnets sequence, to Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnets from the Portuguese, to present-day modern love poetry, and some would say song lyrics. So, love and poetry seem somehow to go together. After all, poetry is written for somebody, an audience, an other, who responds to its language. And who better to respond to the language of poems than a lover? So today, we're going to do a poem called Valentine by the British poet Carol Ann Duffy. It's a very famous poem. It's a very unusual poem. I hope you appreciate my preamble about the history of love poetry because in a sense, Carol Ann Duffy plays with that convention. So the poem is titled Valentine. Now it starts conventionally as per the title, Valentine, a poem about love written maybe on St. Valentine's Day to a lover. But note how Carol and Duffy shocks us with the first line. Not a red rose or a satin heart. Carol and Duffy brings up traditional conventional symbols of love. After all, a red rose has been enshrined in love poetry in our common understanding about love as something you give to the beloved. And a satin heart. What could be more conventional? What could be more usual? What could be more romantic, you might say, than a heart made up of satin to give to a lover on Valentine's Day? But Carol and Duffy shocks us. Not a red rose or a satin heart. In other words, I am going to go against the conventional symbols of love. While you might say, maybe they've gone out of use. Maybe they've descended into cliché. Maybe they don't really represent what is at stake in love. Maybe they don't bring us to the core of this most surprising, yet most universal emotion. So Carol Antafi takes us by the jugular in her surprising opening sentence, which is the first stanza also. So the poem surprises. The poem continually challenges our expectations. Now, this only makes sense if we understand the whole history of love poetry. This is what a poet like Carol N. Duffy rebels against. What's the next line of the second stanza? I give you an onion. Now, I'm going to be using this onion in my presentation a lot. Now, an onion, the furthest thing away from a red rose, from a satin heart. An onion that is used to depict love. An onion that is used in a love poem. Strange, you might say. Let's see what Carol Nenefi does with the onion. Now, you might note this whole poem about an onion is going to unfold in what we call an extended metaphor. A metaphor is a rhetorical, a literary device used to compare two things. A is B, based on some similarity, based on some con contiguity that the poem teases out. An extended metaphor is a metaphor that is developed, that is extended throughout the poem, that is pursued right, for more than a couple of lines. So love is an onion. This is the surprising equation that Carol and Duffy makes. I give you an onion. Instead of a red rose, instead of a satin heart, the lover is giving an onion to the beloved. Now what could be further away? from conventional symbols of love. After all, an onion, look at it. It's ordinary, it's everyday. You don't associate it with love. You don't associate it with anything romantic, right? And yet the poet is giving the onion to the lover. Why? The answer is developed. It is a moon wrapped in brown paper. Now, if you look at it carefully, right? This, the onion really does, to some extent, look like a moon. Right? The moon, and it's wrapped in brown paper. The moon, something associated with the night, something associated with a kind of romantic atmosphere. It is a moon wrapped in something ordinary, in something nondescript, in something that looks almost ugly, you might say, wrapped in brown paper. Right? And yet, 
the onion promises light. So something underneath its humble exterior, something underneath its nondescript uh, uh, appearance promises something unusual, something spectacular, something inviting. And that perhaps is what the experience of love could be for some people, like the careful undressing of love. When we peel an onion, we undress, we remove its unattractive exterior to use what is on the inside, what is more valuable. So Carol and Duffy might make the point that, that love is, after all, an uncovering, an unmasking, a getting by appearances once you unveil what lovers put up in defense right, of each other, then we get to what might seem to be more essential of love. So the careful undressing of love. Immediately in the first two stanzas, Carol and Nafi makes the metaphor work. Takes the onion, looks at it, and thinks about its relation to love. Here, it will blind you with tears like a lover. Carol and Duffy, the speaker, gives the onion to the beloved. Here, take it. Why? It will blind you with tears like a lover. So love is, love is a powerful emotion, right? We can't escape the more negative aspects of being in love. Crying, break up, and so forth. So when we cut an onion, of course, everybody knows we cry. It's a natural reaction to the chemicals released by the, by the onion. And so therefore, the experience of love is a similarly blinding experience, a similarly overwhelming experience, and that is connected to the cutting of the onion, like a lover. It will make your reflection a wobbling photo of grief. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you see yourself not as you are, but at your most vulnerable, a wobbling photo of grief. So the experiences when we are in love and the experiences when we cut an onion somehow are related in some strange, in some unusual, in some wonderful way compared to the cliches that Carol and Duffy sets up. The red rose, the satin heart. Wouldn't you say that an onion now comes to represent what is the more authentic experiences of love? This is how poetry works, challenging our expectations. The romantic poet William Blake says, what is poetry? It is finding eternity in the grain of sand. It is finding the unusual in the usual. It is, to use a term, defamiliarization. Poetry allows us to look at something again, to look at something with fresh eyes, to see emotions from different perspectives. And that is one of the main thrusts of Carol and Duffy's poem. I am trying to be truthful. The speaker hammers home the point of the poem. I am trying to be truthful. I am trying to give the most accurate, to give the most authentic account of what it is like to be in love. Not a cute card or a kissogram. Again, the truth of love is not held in things like a cute card, in things done for ornamental purposes, in even a flippant kissogram. I give you an onion. The point is repeated. It almost becomes a sort of refrain. I'm giving you the onion. As if the beloved isn't quite convinced with the point the poem has been trying to make so far. The line is repeated. Its fierce kiss will stay on your lips, possessive and faithful. Its fierce kiss. Pay attention to the diction. Fierce kiss. The phrase almost sounds like an oxymoron. An oxymoron is a phrase where the two words almost come into violent contradiction with each other. How can a kiss be fierce? A kiss is supposed to be romantic. It's supposed to be smooth. It's supposed to enlighten, right? To bring the lovers into a sort of romantic mood. But with this idea of fierce kiss, the more obsessive aspects of love are highlighted, will stay on your lips. Being in love is a powerful experience. Being in love is almost a kind of obsessive experience. And that sting from the onion 
which says on the lips of anyone who's eaten an onion is compared to the fierce kiss of love. Possessive and faithful as we are, for as long as we are. Carol and Duffy implies that as long as the emotion of love is there, the experience is powerful, it's obsessive, it's fierce. But there is a date to it. It isn't eternal. Carol and Duffy makes the point, for as long as we are. So, the lovers and their experiences isn't therefore everlasting. There is a day. And after all, I guess any kind of powerful emotion does after all run its course after a while. Take it. Its platinum loops shrink to a wedding ring if you like. Here, instead of a valentine card, instead of a kissogram, instead of a rose, here, this is the pledge of my love for you. If you cut inside, you would see the loops, the loops of the onion shrinking to a wedding ring. Now think about that, this idea of platinum, something that is associated with metal, a precious metal. Something ordinary like the onion is compared to platinum metal. So once again, the poem finds the extraordinary in the ordinary. Once again, the poem tries to use something as humble as an onion to suggest something about love. So its platinum loops shrink to a wedding ring. Of course, wedding ring implying commitment, implying promise, everlasting love. But think about the diction here. The loops of the onion shrink to a wedding ring. There is some sort of confinement. There is some sort of shrinkage might the poem suggest that love in as much as it is blinding, it is obsessive, it is powerful, it is also something that it's like, it's like a constraint. It's something that shrinks you. It's something that reduces both lovers to something like a wedding ring, to something resembling commitment, to something resembling the rigors of marriage, if you like. Lethal. Its scent will cling to your fingers, cling to your knife. The poem ends on an unsettling note. The onion is now not only a symbol of obsessive love, powerful love, but it is also lethal. Its scent now becomes something terrifying, almost horrifying. Its scent will cling to your fingers. That idea of obsession never goes away. It will cling to your knife. The experience of love never really washes away. The experience of love never really fades away. The lingering aftertaste, the lingering after scent right, of, the, of the onion is compared to love in a certain sense. And it is this more unpalatable aspect of love that the poem ends with. It clings to your knife. Think about the final image of the knife. The knife implying danger. The knife implies some sort of violence. Carol and Duffy suggests that while love has its more romantic sides, that while love has its more positive aspects, it ultimately also entails some sort of threat, some sort of danger, some sort of risk. To get a full picture of love, we cannot just rely on conventional cliched symbols like, of course, the red rose, of course, the satin heart. The truth of love is both positive and negative. It lifts a person up, it also brings a person down. It makes a person better than he is, but it also becomes obsessive. It reduces, shrinks is the word that's used in the penultimate stanza. So in the poem, ultimately, Carol N. Duffy tries to bring us to a different place, bring us to a different mindset suggesting that the truth of love, the authenticity of its representation, can't be really contained in traditional romantic symbols. This is what she's rebelling against. In its place, Carol and Duffy offers the lover the onion and what the onion represents. Now, if you think about the speaker, if you think about the gender dynamics in place, you will also think about the fact that it is a female speaker speak, speaking the poem, 
telling the truth about love to a male speaker. Now, in the history of love poetry, as we've talked about, it is usually the man writing the love poem to the woman. So to the love poem, the man, you might say, objectifies the love experience, objectifies the female speaker, presenting a picture of the female speaker and anticipating the reactions of the female speaker. Here, the tables are turned. Here, the opposite happens. Carol N. Duffy uses the female voice to present love to the male speaker, to the male other. And in a sense, this is also another aspect of how this poem goes against the tradition of love poetry. In its symbol, in its speaking voice, in its use of image, in its tone, we see today how a poem like Valentine challenges our perceptions, our preconceptions of how love should be, what kind of experience love is, what is the ideal Valentine's Day gift that the lover gives the beloved. So when we are analyzing this poem, it is crucial that you pay attention to context. It is crucial that you pay attention to what the poem is actually writing against. This is how to read a poem. Thank you.